Hello and welcome as we gather to worship God together. However you're joining us for this service, I pray that you will know God's love and God's presence with you as we come to hear his word, to worship and bless him, and to remind ourselves through his Holy Spirit that we are his. Let's come before him now with our opening prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for bringing us together for this service. When we can praise you, pray to you and listen for your words. But thank you that you're building us together to do more than just that. To declare your praises, to share your love, to show your glory everywhere and always. We can't do this by ourselves, but through your Holy Spirit, we can. So in this time together, draw us closer to you and to each other. Remind us of all you have done for us through Jesus. And remind us that we are your people, sent to share all we have in you with the world. In Christ's name, Amen. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed. On account of his vast mercy, he has given us new birth. You have been born anew into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You have a pure and enduring inheritance that cannot perish, an inheritance that is presently kept safe in heaven for you. We worship God together for all that he has done for us, and we sing, Jesus put this song into our hearts. Here we go. Jesus put this song into our hearts. Jesus put this song into our hearts. It's a song of joy no one can take away. Jesus put this song into our hearts. Jesus, turn 
Let's come before God with our personal prayers. Let us pray. And praise God for his love, his grace, his mercy and kindness. Thank God for the things that he's done for us, big and small. We confess our sins to God. Let's ask for God's help for whatever we need it for. and bring whatever prayer we have on our hearts to God. And let's share together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
our first reading. <coughs> our first reading today comes from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting at verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Therefore take care to follow the commands, decrees and laws I give you today. Our second reading comes from the first letter of Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 4 and it's read for us. By Ray. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the stone that causes people to stumble and the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobeyed the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Thank you, Ray. And may God bless to us the reading of his word today. Who are you? I don't just mean what's your name, although it would be great to know who's watching and listening to this. So if you are doing so online, leave a comment and share with us who you are. But on a deeper level, who are you? What sort of person are you? What do you do? How do you act? What's your personality? Uh, what motivates you? And what's made you that person? What have you been through in your life that's created the person who's stood or sat watching or listening to this service now? What experiences have you been through, good or bad? How have those shaped you and made you the person you consider yourself to be today? Who are you? According to the 1 Peter passage that Ray just read to us, you are something astonishing. You are part of a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Wow, you are something amazing. In fact, you are so amazing that you are a brick. I don't mean that as an insult to say that you're dense and unthinking and motionless. 
I don't mean it either as that old-fashioned compliment from Eni Blyton novels or whatever. Oh, you are a brick. Someone at my old church where I grew up once called me that, and it took me a moment to realise it was good. You are, though, a brick, or rather a living stone in the words of that one Peter passage. You are part of something extraordinary. You are part of this spiritual house or temple that God is building to declare his glory, to show his love and to sing his praises to the world. You are part of that. Obviously, this isn't a physical cathedral like St. Paul's or Westminster Abbey or St. Peter's in the Vatican City. You're not a, a physical temple like the great temples of Jerusalem's past or that strange Mormon temple just off the M61 at Chorley. You are part of something much bigger, much greater, much longer lasting than that. This people of God, God's church with a capital C, not Greenfield Church, or rather not just Greenfield Church or whichever church you might go to or consider yourself to belong to, but part of the church throughout the whole world, all of God's people in every part of the world who are all committed to loving God, to loving the world in his name and declaring his praises. This church that stretches right back to the time of Jesus and will stretch on until the time when he comes again. You are part of that. You are a brick, a living stone in, in that. Now, why are you that? What's brought you to that position? What brought me to that position? Is it our great beauty and attractiveness? <laughs> Maybe not. Is it our deep theological insight and knowledge, our understanding of great mysteries about Christ? Well, maybe you have that or maybe you don't, but that's not the answer. Is it because we live a, a perfect and worthy life such that when God was reaching through his heavenly Lego box, and there's nothing more satisfying than that, he picked us out and saw us as the perfect piece with which to build the next part of his church? I very rarely feel like that. The answer is kind of obvious. But it bears repeating, we are this because of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love towards us. Think back to that Deuteronomy reading as Moses is speaking to the people of Israel and he says to them, yes, God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. But Moses also says that God didn't do that because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because God loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors, that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. God chose the people of Israel perhaps because they were the fewest, but he chose them because of his love and because he had sworn that he would keep them and rescue them from slavery. And of course, of course, as it was with them, so it is with us. We are these living stones. We are who we are in Christ because of Christ, because God loved us, as Paul reminds us, while we were still sinners, because in his mercy, God saw us with all our struggles and faults and failings and loved us and brought us to life in Christ. That Christ died for us to take away our sins. That Christ rose again, that we might truly live not just with the physical, biological life that we live and breathe, but with the life of his spirit, a life that even death cannot oppose. We are part of this great building project, perhaps because of our unworthiness. And maybe if we do feel unworthy of it, that's not a bad sign, because it means we can be open to God enabling us to do this. But of course, who we are, or who we think we are, hugely affects 
what we do, our attitudes and the actions that spring from that. We hope that if we've had a reasonably good life, not without its struggles, of course, no one lives without struggles, but if our lives have been reasonably okay, we will be okay people as a result of that. If life has been hard to us, then maybe we think that that will, I don't know, increase our insecurity, our, our anxiety, give us a negative view of ourselves and maybe other people as well. Of course, it doesn't always work like that. Some people who've had a blessed and good life can be arrogant, aloof, not understanding the very real struggles that people less fortunate than them go through. And I'm sure we know stories of people who have gone through all kinds of traumas and abuse and difficulties in their lives, but have risen above it, who have been strengthened by it and have become inspiring people. But even they have been shaped by what they've gone through. And who they become because of that affects who they are, makes them the people that they become for better or for worse. And these passages are shot through with this as well. The whole point of not just the passage we heard from Deuteronomy, but the whole book is to urge the people of Israel as they enter the promised land to keep to God's commandments, commandments he set out in the desert, to live God's ways, not just because God is their manager and he will be cross if they haven't kept commandment 6, paragraph 3, subsection 2, sentence 4. But because he loves them. And because keeping these laws will bring life. Now we can't overlook that in this passage there is a very real threat and warning. That those who hate him he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. And we have to wrestle and reckon with a God who is holy and who hates sin, even as he loves those who fall prey to it. And yet the appeal is not just to the threat, but to the love of God. And because of that love that God has shown them, when they go into that land, they are to act and live as God's special possession, as God's holy people. The 1 Peter passage hints at it as well. And before and after it come more explicit urges to live in particular ways because of what God has done through Christ Jesus. After it, they're told that they're to not let their lives be governed by the kind of selfish desires that so often grip our world. The desires for power, and wealth, fame, sex, popularity and all the rest of it. And before it, they're called to live a life of love and openness towards each other. To not allow dishonesty, lies, hypocrisy, slander, gossip, that kind of whispering in the corner about other people or the private emails sent purely for prayer, of course, which are actually getting at others. They're to live with a, an open love and generosity towards each other that has no place for those kinds of things. And in doing that, they will show God's love and sing God's praises to the world and they will respond to all that God has done for them. Now, even as I say this, even as you hear this, we become aware that we and the church as a whole has failed this that we haven't lived according to who we are and whom God has made us that we fail every single day that we slip into those bad habits that we let those desires control us that we forget the love of God or think we're entitled to it and the church throughout history has failed as well badly, dreadfully failed, allowed its desire for power to drive out the story of Christ who gave up his power and glory for us, allowed a desire for wealth to tread down on the poor whom Christ called us to serve. 
It has abused people, as is coming to light now. And worse than that, perhaps, if anything could be worse than that, has hidden it away, covered it up, pretended it doesn't matter, or said it would take action and then not bothered in an effort to keep its reputation, ironically trashing its reputation in the process. And yet, and yet, we are called to more than that. We are made to be different from that. We are God's special possession. We are his holy people. And because of that, through the power of the spirit that he freely gives to us, we are to live differently, to stand out, not because we're better, but because God is great and loving and kind and merciful. We are to be people whose lives will not speak of our own perfection, but of God's grace and God's mercy. We might not feel up to the task. We might feel the weight of our failures and of the failures of the church as a whole. And yet God, in his love and his mercy, keeps calling us, keeps nudging us to remind us of who we are, whom he has made us, so that we might declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We come to our time of prayer for other people. And as with our personal prayers, I will suggest some things that you might want to pray for. But again, as always, if you have your own prayers, then use this time as you need to. Let's pray. And begin by just sharing with God anything that's struck you, stuck with you, maybe confused you or something that you don't agree with in what we've been thinking about. Praise God once more for his amazing grace in making us part of his building work in the world. What part might you have in this? Might there be a particular role or place that God has? Ask him about this, about where and how he might want to use you. Pray for someone you love and pray for someone whom you find it hard to love. Pray for God's church, where you are, throughout this country, and in all the world.
And finally, pray for the places and the situations where God's light and glory is needed more than ever. Loving and living God, we do thank you for your grace and your mercy. For the fact that you have not left us to our own devices and that you have not left your world, but that you are working through all your people to bring your love and your grace and your transforming power into the world. May we, Lord, be part of that. May we trust in you and follow you with all of our hearts. And may we remember always that it begins not with us, but with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We close our time of worship with a final hymn reminding ourselves that we are one through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, but that we need God's work to continue to draw us closer together, that we might show his love to the people and the world around us. We sing, we are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to our Creator from whom all things come And all praise to Christ Jesus, God's only Son And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love And they'll know we are Christians by our love and they'll know we are Christians by our love. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send.
and let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. As always, thank you for taking time to take part in this service. God bless you this week. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.